Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending where you are in the world. Today, we have a record number of people in around 50 countries and all continents watching this session. Welcome everyone to Navigating the Labyrinth of US Privacy Laws, Building a Compliance Program. We thank Yayan, Jolly, and Chris Ekdahl from Linklaters in the US for joining us today. Thank you to Linklaters, the leading London-based law firm for sponsoring today's session. I'm Stuart Dresner, founder and chief executive of Privacy Laws and Business, the world's most experienced information company specializing in this field now in our 35th year. Thank you to the uh, many people attending who keep up to date by subscribing to our international and UK reports published in alternate months in online PDF and paper formats. For those who don't subscribe, information is at privacylaws.com forward slash reports. Now, thousands of people download our news and hundreds of people also download our Privacy Path podcasts. We've released an average of nearly one podcast per month for the last year and a half. And the most recent one is Canada Leads on Applying Privacy Law to Sales of Recreational Cannabis. The podcasts are available on our website or wherever you find your podcasts. Now, if you have any questions for the speakers, please type them in the Q&A section which we'll find at the right of your screen. Type in the questions after you think of them, although the plan is to take questions after the presentations if there's time. However, we're aware that this is a very full presentation, so the speakers are very kindly agreed to answer your questions in writing after the event. A recording of the video of this session will be available to you after the session. Turning to today's subject, around 20 years ago, we at Privacy Laws and Business won the contract to assess the state of privacy laws in the US for the European Commission. The lack of adequate privacy laws from the European perspective led first to the EC-US safe harbor, followed by the EU-US privacy shield. Both hit difficulties in overcoming the differences between the two sides. A few years ago, President Barack Obama proposed that the US Congress adopt a federal privacy law but was unsuccessful due to competing interests in federal government departments, congressional committees, and disagreement on the future relationship between a federal privacy law and state privacy laws. And we're going to see this theme in today's presentation. Now, the lead privacy regulator in the US is the Federal Trade Commission, and certainly the new FTC chair, Lena Khan, is more energetic on privacy issues than her predecessors. We can expect stronger sanctions but the FTC is constrained by its narrow scope and lack of a comprehensive federal privacy statute. Meanwhile, the initiative is being taken by the states with California, California in the lead once again, as it was from 20 years ago with a data breach law. This was later copied by the other 49 states. <coughs> now, Virginia and Colorado are the first states to follow California's privacy lead uh, with new state privacy laws, but each one is different from the other making life difficult for, for companies doing business across the country. To guide us through this labyrinth, we have Yayan Jolly and Chris Ekdahl from Linklaters in the US. First, Yayan, he's a partner at Linklaters in New York. He's co-chair of the data solutions practice at Linklaters in the US, with experience spanning three continents and dual qualified in the US and the UK. Yayan synthesizes global privacy compliance and provides strategic commercial advice on a range of innovative, data-driven and technology-enabled transactions in the US. The National Law Journal recognized him as one of the nation's regulatory and compliance trailblazers. And in Europe, he was inducted into the Legal 500's Hall of Fame as a leading technology and data protection lawyer. Turning to Chris Ekdahl, you're a senior associate in the Linklaters Data Solutions Cyber and Privacy Practice based in Chicago. And his practice spans compliance counseling on US data privacy and consumer protection regulations, data breach investigation and response, advertising technology, programmatic media buying, and negotiating complex commercial statutes, and sorry, commercial agreements, including those related to technology, licensing, and data sourcing. Chris has prepared testimony for submission to the California Senate Judiciary Committee and has participated in industry efforts to shape the US privacy legislation. That's enough for me and over to you, Yayan. Thank you, Stuart, and thanks for everybody for joining. Um, 
So let's take a step back and see how we landed here with so many new laws being proposed and some groundbreaking new laws actually being implemented. Over the past five years, US companies have been forced to expand their compliance programs to comply with an, uh, an, an expanding array of international and US state privacy laws. The wave of privacy laws began in May 2018 when the GDPR became effective, triggering new compliance obligations for US companies with operations in Europe. Um, and then on the heels of that, other countries such as Australia, Brazil, India, Canada and China all passed or expanded new privacy legislation, further expanding the scope of privacy compliance for US multinationals. Many of the same pressures that prompted the European and international regulations are growing rapidly in America. In 2020, the California Consumer Privacy Act became effective. This was the first comprehensive privacy law in the US and it triggered a new set of legal requirements for US companies. Since the implementation of the CCPA, consumer privacy legislation has passed again in California, then in Virginia and most recently in Colorado. And during the 2021 legislative session, over 150 privacy related bills have been introduced. So the dilemma for US multinationals is how to manage compliance with the growing patchwork of state and international privacy obligations. These laws share many characteristics, but they each differ in ways that complicate compliance. So while the GDPR provides common themes among the new US laws, there are enough differences between these laws that simply complying with the GDPR would not be adequate to achieve US compliance. So the purpose of this webinar is to compare and contrast the major US privacy laws, try and identify areas of overlap, as well as areas where compliance will require state-specific analysis, disclosures, and policies. In this webinar, we will start by giving some of the background on the complexity of the US privacy landscape and the risk profile of the US market from a privacy compliance standpoint. And then we'll propose a streamlined solution to implement a US privacy compliance program and then explain where and how you can effectively leverage your existing compliance in Europe. So, good. Slide. So in order to build an effective compliance program, you first have to understand the complexity of the legal frameworks in which you're operating. And you need to understand the risk profile of the jurisdiction. So let's start by comparing and contrasting the EU with the US for a minute so we see some differences. Firstly, it's important to change the perception about GDPR compliance being the silver bullet that gets you compliant with all laws in the US. Being GDPR compliant certainly gives you a very good head start with your US compliance program, but there's a long way to go. We hear many clients operating under the following misconceptions. GDPR is the high watermark for privacy compliance. So if you're in good compliance with the GDPR, by default, you're in compliance with all other laws. GDPR is the gold standard. It's comprehensive enough to capture all other laws. The US doesn't have a comprehensive national law, so there's not much to comply with. These are often the perceptions held by many multinationals based in Europe and abroad, to which we say you're wrong. GDPR is just the beginning. If you have exposure to the US, imagine trying to comply with multiple versions of the GDPR, then augment the GDPR with sectoral laws, then augment it again with consumer protection statutes, then augmented again with state laws, then augmented again with self-regulatory regimes. And you start to get a picture of the labyrinth of US privacy laws that will have a material impact on your business. The realities of operating in the US are very different. So let's just level set on some of these comparisons. The US, frankly, has many more privacy laws to navigate than the EU. Whilst the EU has an array of consumer protection statutes that are adjacent to the GDPR and to the EU privacy regulation, it's primarily those two laws that govern privacy in Europe. 
class action lawsuits in the US create a much more litigious environment in which to operate. And we'll talk more about um, what a unique animal class action lawsuits are. The GDPR creates a comprehensive set of privacy requirements, but the US has very novel features, particularly in these new laws that go above and beyond GDPR. We'll see that the new state privacy laws require a variety of opt-ins and opt-out links to be displayed on websites and includes notions of data selling and addresses the offering of financial incentives. Lastly, the fines and enforcement regime in the US is very different and typically far higher than what we see in Europe. So yes, Europe made huge headlines with fines of up to 4% of turnover. But until recently, excluding the mega fines against Amazon and Google and WhatsApp, the fines levied by European regulators were historically a fraction of the penalties imposed by US regulators. Just by way of example, the UK's Information Commissioner's Office fined Facebook £500,000 for violating data protection um, provisions, while the FTC fined Facebook £5 billion. And in the US, there are so many regulators that can sanction violators. And as Stuart said, while the FTC has wide powers under Section 5 of the FTC Act to enforce privacy violations that are unfair or deceptive practices, that's just the tip of the enforcement iceberg. Companies also have to navigate state attorneys generals, the SEC, the FCC, the OCC, to name but a few regulatory agencies. Data breaches. The risk profile for data breaches in the US is the highest anywhere in the world. According to a survey performed by IBM, the global average cost of a data breach was 3.9 million in 2020. That's the global average. The average cost of a data breach in the US is over 8.6 million. Security breaches are prolific in the US. We're currently handling half a dozen incidents and navigating ransomware threats with attackers demanding millions in Bitcoin. Fines have ranged from 90 million for the Capital One breach to 700 million for the Equifax breach. And with respect to the Equifax breach, the total costs of that breach for Equifax after settling with regulators and class action suits is approaching 1.5 billion. And class action suits are a common consequence of data breaches. And we have seen those suits add millions in damages to the final bill. As Ian mentioned, it's quite common to see class action lawsuits in the wake of large scale data breaches. For instance, T-Mobile is already facing dozens of disparate class action lawsuits in relation to the data breach it reported in August, which affected nearly 50 million customers. But it isn't only data breaches that lead to class action lawsuits in the United States. In fact, many privacy related statutes in the US include a private right of action. And this private litigation risk often dwarfs the potential penalties under the regulatory fines. For example, Illinois biometric privacy law, which we'll discuss again in a bit, creates statutory penalties of up to $1,000 per violation or up to $5,000 per violation, depending on the severity of the wrongdoing. And the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, the TCPA, creates statutory penalties of up to $500 or $1,500, depending on the severity of the infringement. And the CCPA, which we'll spend a, a lot of time talking about today, creates statutory penalties of up to $750 per violation if a data breach results from the failure of a company to implement reasonably, reasonable security standards, which causes the loss of consumers' unencrypted personal information. What makes class action risk so dangerous in this space with privacy statutes is that individual plaintiffs don't need to allege any particular harm in order to file a lawsuit and get a payout. Rather, a plaintiff merely needs to show that the business violated the law in some technical aspect. Classes can be hundreds of thousands of plaintiffs or millions or even tens of millions. So the scale of penalties can balloon quickly when you multiply each plaintiff by the statutory damages. For example, 
Imagine a data breach that led to the unauthorized disclosure of sensitive personal information of 100,000 California residents. And that was due to a company's failure to implement reasonable security standards under the CCPA. With the CCPA statutory damages of up to $750 per person, that could lead to potential exposure of up to $75 million quickly and easily. So it's class action lawsuits are a significant differentiator from non-US jurisdictions and a major source of risk of non-compliance in the US. Yeah, and did we, yeah, and I think we lost your sound. Okay, thank you, Chris. So we, we see that US laws have some very novel elements of, um, uh, of privacy law that go well above and beyond GDPR. For example, we've talked about, uh, or we've referenced the notion of data sales. This, this is an entirely new notion in, in, in privacy law. Um, which has a dramatic effect on digital advertising and the marketing efforts of, of companies in the US. We'll go into this in more detail in, in a little while. In addition to the notion of data sales, there are new requirements to include links on websites, links to offer opt-outs of targeted advertising, links to offer opt-outs of sharing of sensitive personal information, links to offer the opt-outs of um, sharing information in connection with data sales. In addition, there are new opt-in requirements imposed by these new laws. And that's a game changer in the US because the US has typically opt operated on an opt-out regime. So we're seeing a variety of new operational implications coming out of these new US privacy laws, as well as legal concepts, which are somewhat groundbreaking on, on the world privacy stage. So as we as as we examine that this dizzying patchwork of, of of laws in the U.S., one of the interesting elements is that at the state level, states can propose very specific laws governing different sectors. A perfect example of this is in the biometric space. I mentioned a few minutes ago the class action prevalence in the U.S. Illinois biometric privacy law known as BIPA is one of the leading sources of such lawsuits and it is one of a handful of state and local biometric laws in the US. There are three factors that explain why BIPA unlike the others is such a hot litigation claim. First, BIPA plaintiffs don't need to show actual harm in order to sue. So non-compliance with the technicalities of the law is sufficient to grant standing to sue. Second, BIPA has very prescriptive compliance requirements, and that's a theme you'll see across the US is that our laws typically are very prescriptive in terms of what specific items need to be done. Uh, and that level of specificity raises the risk of missing a technical compliance point. So under BIPA, you must give individuals a copy of your written data retention policy for biometric data. You must provide written notice that describes what biometric information will be collected, the purpose for collecting it, and how long it will be stored. You have to obtain prior opt-in consent for each specific collection use and sharing case for biometric information. And you can't sell biometric da data no matter what, you can't even be consented to. If you fail to do any one of those things, you can be subject to a BIPA lawsuit. And the third reason why BIPA lawsuits are so widespread is that BIPA creates large statutory damages, up to $1,000 for negligent violations or up to $5,000 for intentional violations. If you multiply those damages by the number of consumers or employees in a class, you can see why a class actions plaintiff's attorney could be very interested in pursuing the case. As you see from the example settlements here, which are just a few of very, very many, you see a new settlement almost daily in, in my news clips, the penalties under the, under the US privacy law can be quite severe. Like BIPA, with its very prescriptive laws and the propensity for class action lawsuits, the next terrain to navigate in the US labyrinth are data protection and data breach laws in all 50 states. So th th this is a key factor that is fundamentally different in the US compared to Europe. And it's the, it's the data breach reporting regime. 
because it creates a complex maze of 50 state laws with differing requirements and riddled with traps that can lead to lawsuits and enforcement actions. Navigating the complexities of breach notification regulations is like solving a puzzle. You align the information, you look for patterns, and plan several steps ahead so that when all the pieces click into place, you have a simple, clear picture of what the law requires. So if, after being a victim of a cybercrime, a company has to confront a maze of disclosure obligations. The customer notification requirements will depend on the customer's residence and jurisdiction. Um, almost every state has a data breach notification requirements, but they can differ significantly in scope and application. In California and Florida, for example, a customer's username and security question would qualify as protected information, but this wouldn't be the case in Wisconsin or Connecticut, for example. State laws differ not only in the types of data breaches they regulate, but also in who, what, when, and how they require companies to notify their customers. In California, Florida, and Connecticut, for example, companies may also have to notify particular state agencies. So even though a company may operate nationally and have its security system managed centrally, the company has to tailor each notification to fit the specific requirements of the state in which each customer resides. Failure to do so can expose the company to state penalties for technical non-compliance, as well as potential civil litigation. Depending on the type of the information, for example, whether it's personal information or protected health information or PCI information or trade secrets, companies may be subject to multiple overlapping federal and state regimes. For example, reporting may be required to the SEC, to the Department of Health and Human Services, to the FCC, and other federal and state agencies. Again, some states like California and Wisconsin exempt companies from their data notification laws if an individual is separately regulated under HIPAA, for example. Other states, such as Florida and Connecticut, have no such exemption. Then you have to consider the issue of who must be notified. And data breach standards differ on whether the customer or the individual must be notified every time there's a breach. Some states, like Connecticut and Florida, have a harm analysis that's used to determine whether notification is required in the first place, whereas others, like California, do not. In addition to notifying individuals, some states require a public report filing, but they differ on the circumstances when the report must be filed. So California and Florida require a report when personal information was disclosed for more than 500 residents. But when notice is given to more than 1,000 people, other states like Missouri or North Carolina require a company to give notice to the state attorney general, as well as all the consumer reporting agencies. So under these different state statutes, the same breach incident can result in mandated disclosures to individuals and public agencies in some jurisdictions, but not in others. It's, it really is a minefield. Absent a comprehensive national law in the US, states are start, starting to step in to fill the vacuum. We'll focus today on California, Virginia, and Colorado, but as you can see, about two thirds of the states have tried or are still trying to pass comprehensive privacy legislation of their own. Proposals are still pending in six states. All six of those proposals would create do not sell rights, but two of those would go beyond the current law and require an affirmative opt in to sales rather than making that an opt out right, which would be a major change under US law. Three of the pending proposals also create a private right of action for technical non-compliance, much like BIPA or TCPA do. So looking at this map, it seems like it's a question of when the next state law will pass, not if another state law will pass. So with that backdrop and an understanding of the complexities and risk profile of the US privacy landscape, how do you build a compliance program for the US? Well, one answer is to run separate systems, processes, and procedures. However, implementing, managing, and overseeing two different but parallel approaches to data processing 
will undoubtedly strain the resources of any organization. Making use of several systems, depending on the type of data and the location from which it was gathered, introduce a level of complexity that will impact the efficiency of the operations, and it could lead to mix-ups and mistakes, potentially resulting in fines or sanctions for non-compliance with the correct regulations. In addition, you further confuse the issue by understanding that a single individual may be subject to multiple sets of legislation. The same data for one individual could fall within different state laws requiring different sets of obligations. So the more common answer is to take a single approach. And a single approach effectively applies the GDPR fundamental principles of data protection, irrespective of geography, whilst providing functionality to ensure compliance with the US legislation. So we've seen that GDPR efforts can be leveraged to some degree, but will have to be augmented by state and sector specific requirements that go beyond GDPR and are modified to reflect the, dis the different risk profile of the US landscape. Our recommendation is to take a single streamlined approach based on the highest common denominator amongst the laws, and then only make state-specific adjustments if a material difference would significantly lessen the compliance burden. In order to execute this strategy, we have suggested several work streams that capture the key privacy domains in the US. Within each domain, there are a number of areas of focus addressed by the relevant privacy laws. We've broken this up into work streams that would be familiar with GDPR practitioners, and it encompasses the specific, the specific US compliance tasks. So we have standard obligations under fair information processing. We have to address data security. We have to address vendor management, uh, the consumer rights, we have to really be careful when we're looking at consumer choice options because they have fundamentally changed in the US from, in many cases, what was an opt-out regime is now an opt-in regime. And we have to include links on different websites. We have to look at privacy governance and, 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 in, and engage in data mapping, privacy notice, and employee management. So the starting point for this US program is actually to um, is to prepare a legal framework matrix. And that describes in detail the key compliance tasks under the applicable privacy laws compared against the GDPR. So we would address GDPR as the starting point to the extent that you have uh, made efforts to comply with GDPR, and then augment that with the requirements under California, Virginia, and Colorado, and, and the evolving state laws that we, we are seeing being proposed. And we typically provide a jurisdiction by jurisdiction analysis and group those analyses on common themes. So you can compare and contrast each jurisdiction independently, but on the same topic or question. A snapshot is provided on this slide, and, and full disclosure, the Excel spreadsheet is too long to fit on one slide, and my formatting skills are terrible. So let's dig into what this compliance program looks like in more detail. Fortunately, from a compliance perspective, when it comes to the core consumer privacy rights, there is substantial overlap in the US state laws. Most of these rights will be familiar to those who've built GDPR programs, but not all of them. We'll discuss these all in depth, but I wanna preview three important distinctions now. First, the right to opt out of sales of personal information is absolutely unique from GDPR. Under the new US state laws, individuals have the right to tell a company not to sell their personal information to a third party. This doesn't just cover the traditional data broker activities where one company sends a massive data file to another company. Sales under state laws also include routine practices that most websites engage in, namely allowing third party advertising cookies to be placed on your website. So the scope of routine business activities covered by the do not sell right is potentially vast. And compliance with this new right requires the addition of a specific hyperlink on your website and mobile apps and within the privacy policy itself that says, do not sell my personal information. 
Likewise, the right to opt out of targeted advertising is another key differentiator between emerging U.S. framework and the GDPR. Beginning in 2023, consumers in some U.S. states will have the right to opt out of having their personal information shared for purposes of cross-contextual behavioral advertising. This is very similar to the do not sell right with regard to advertising cookies. And also like the do not sell right, compliance steps require the addition of a link on your website and mobile apps again that says do not share my personal information. But you can combine these two links for do not sell and do not share. And finally, while Europeans are used to special restrictions around sensitive personal, personal data, under California law, businesses that process sens sensitive personal information will need to put a link on their website, again, that says, limit the use of my sensitive personal information. Consumers will have the right to opt out of the use or sharing of their sensitive personal data, except to the extent that it is necessary for the business to use or share that information in order to provide the product or service to the consumer. So this opt-out right for sensitive personal information is potentially very impactful for ad tech and digital advertising. For your company, if your marketing segments happen to include sensitive data points like geolocation or race and ethnicity, then you may be impacted by these new opt-out rights. Unlike the GDPR, as I've mentioned, U.S. laws tend to be highly prescriptive about submission methods and other compliance points. For submission, you must provide at least two ways for people to submit their requests. If you collect data in person, one of those methods must be a toll-free phone number. And if you collect uh, personal information, and if you sell personal information, you need to provide an online web form for submitting requests online. In addition to those, email, postal mail, online account, um, those would all be acceptable methods as well for submission uh, of the rights requests. U.S. state laws set 45 days as the deadline for completing a response, which can be extended to 90 days for complex requests. But in California, do not sell requests need to be honored within 15 business days. And also in California, with its specific requirements, uh, you must provide an acknowledgement of receipts of any request within 10 days. So there are these interim steps that you have to take in order to be compliant under, under California law. When it comes to managing consumer rights requests, there's not much meaningful distinction between the U.S. approach and the GDPR approach to authentication or verification of requests. Um, California law, as you'll sense a theme, is more prescriptive, however, and California specifies that two or three pieces of matching personal information may be needed, depending on the nature of the request. That is, a deletion request might require a, a lesser degree of verification than a request for giving specific pieces of personal information. And you can understand why those two requests might have different thresholds for, for verification needs. When it comes to access portability rights, again, there's not a whole lot of meaningful distinction between the US approach and the GDPR approach. Uh, one nuance, however, is that under the CPRA, businesses will need to disclose upon request um, how long personal information and sensitive PI will be kept. So if a consumer asks for that information, you will be required to provide that uh, moving forward. Another nuance that's worth noting is that when it comes to giving consumers a portable copy of their personal information, California law expressly prohibits companies from providing actual copies of sensitive information. So instead, you can only describe the types of sensitive information you have. So it makes sense if someone you know, asks for their information that happens to include a credit card number or a driver's license number, you won't provide that information to them in the file. You will simply say, we do possess your credit card number and leave it at that. The right of rectification, again, European companies are probably very familiar with this right and the approach under the US state laws will not be all that different. This right will come into effect in California, Virginia, and Colorado in 2023. That said, many US companies already offer some type of functionality in an, at least an informal way by having self-service portals, such as an online account, where users can update their own information because it obviously benefits the company to have current, accurate, and up-to-date consumer information in their, in their database, in their CRM. All three state laws have the equivalent of GDPR's right to erasure. The deletion right in the U.S. is not absolute, and there are exceptions. A business can decline a deletion request where it's 
necessary for the business to keep the information to comply with the law or a subpoena, uh, to fulfill a transaction that's requested by the consumer, or perform a contract with the consumer, such as fulfilling a product warranty, uh, or you can keep information to prevent, detect, respond to illegal activity, data breaches, things of that nature. All three states also allow an exception to keep personal information when it's used solely for internal purposes that are compatible with the individual's expectations, given the context in which that information was provided. Now this exception could be enormous or it could be very narrow. The California Attorney General hasn't publicly offered insights yet to resolve the scope of this exception. So we'll keep an eye out for it in the coming year. Uh, but you, you can read that and see that if you're a business, how exactly do you uh, treat that exception? So it's very much a case by case basis when we uh, counsel clients on, on whether that exception can be relied on for a deletion request. We'll also note that Virginia offers two additional reasons for rejecting a deletion request, which are, are not surprising. Um, another nuance is that in California, companies are explicitly required to downstream any deletion requests to third parties with whom you've shared a person's data. So if you have a service provider or a vendor who's processing certain information on your behalf, you need to downstream any deletion requests to them and ensure that the deletion gets uh, effectuated on, on their end as well. And finally, this one's a bit strange. Colorado doesn't, in their statute, allow for any of these exceptions. So we'll see if that changes between now and when the law takes effect in 2023. But as it stands, Colorado has a very draconian approach to the deletion rights. Um, and, and we'll see if that ends up getting narrowed with a few of the nuances that we just discussed in, in California and Virginia. Um, and as with all other consumer rights, if you don't fulfill a deletion request, you do have to tell the consumer um, that you're not fulfilling the request, the request and explain why, and also notify them of a right to make an appeal. The famous mute button gets us again. So now we hit um, one of the most groundbreaking aspects of the California law and the element that goes above even the GDPR. And it's this concept of data sales, which is based on an extremely broad notion of data sharing. So under um, the California law, there are restrictions on the sale of data and the right for consumers to opt out of the sale of data. And the crux of the issue with data sales is that a sale is defined very broadly as exchanging data for either monetary or other valuable consideration. And it's that phrase, other valuable consideration, that has led to a considerable amount of haggling over the past couple of years as companies try to determine what exactly is a sale. Now, it's still fair to say that there's not complete alignment on the interpretation of a sale. However, from a regulator's perspective, the sharing of certain data, for example, IP addresses or device identifiers, um, IDFAs, ADIDs in the context of programmatic advertising and targeted advertising is likely to be a sale. And to the extent that a third party is allowed to retain data for profiling and similar activities, this is likely to fall within that definition of sale. So obviously companies who engage in digital marketing will need to tread very carefully when dealing with this requirement. Cookie banners and cookie consent management platforms aren't yet required in the US under the, the current state laws. But in our practice, we do see more and more companies are beginning to add them to their US facing websites. And uh, it's interesting. Um, initially, when we began counting on the CCPA back as early as 2018 after passage, there was a strong resistance to cookie banners, but we are seeing more and more companies begin to add them to their site. And that's because as Yein just talked about, when it comes to the third party advertising or retargeting cookies, the, the general consensus is that those could be considered sales under California law and Virginia and Colorado coming up in the future. Given that, Many of our clients are finding that the easiest way to operationalize a do not sell request vis-a-vis -vis those cookies is to have some sort of native functionality that lives on your own website that allows consumers to suppress any cookies that could be 
sales under the law so that you natively on your own platform can disable those sorts of retargeting cookies. The common alternative to, to that approach, which is becoming more common these days, but the common uh, alternative, especially 2019 and 2020, was to have um, to warn consumers when they got to that web form that we talked about on that opt out web form to have a, a bold text there that says to consumers that if they want to stop third party advertising cookies, which by the way could be sales, um, then they would need to separately use the behavioral advertising opt out tools offered by industry groups like the DAA and the NAI. So that was and still is a fairly common approach in the US for companies that don't have a native cookie consent management tool within their own platform. That said, and we should be cautious, the California Attorney General in its informal enforcement letters has warned businesses that this type of approach is too confusing for consumers to understand or implement. So it's unclear whether uh, future enforcement will become stricter with a, a strict prohibition of, of that type of approach. While the laws use different terminology, the, the concept is the same when it comes to cross-contextual behavioral advertising or targeted advertising. Businesses will soon be required under these upcoming laws to give consumers the ability to stop having their personal information shared with third parties for targeted advertising purposes or cross-contextual behavioral advertising. Now this, as I mentioned before, is a very similar right to the do not sell right. And like the do not sell right, this is a novel concept compared to the GDPR and other jurisdictions laws. While the laws define cross-contextual behavioral advertising as the targeting of ads to a consumer based on the personal information obtained from that consumer's activities over time and across different websites or applications, in order to predict of preferences or interests. I think we all sort of inherently get that, but it's always important to, to look at the specific wording of the statutes. Uh, and again, this is exactly the type of activity that we believe the California legislature likely intended to be a sale when they created the do not sell rights under the CCPA in 2018. But as Yade mentioned, there has been a bit of a fog and ambiguity around that in the industry and whether those are sales or are not sales. So under the CPRA, uh, California has tried to remove all doubt on this point. And likewise, Virginia and Colorado have followed suit to create this right to opt out of behavioral advertising to avoid those same types of ambiguities about third party advertising cookies uh, that have sort of plagued the early rollout of the CCPA in the US. This next opt out right is one that many of you will be much more familiar with uh, in general, the right to opt out of profiling and automated decision making. Virginia and Colorado limit this right only to decision making that will produce quote legal or other significant effects. Things like offering credit, uh, reviewing job applications or reviewing housing applications for instance. That means this provision may only come into play into very specific and limited circumstances in those states for many of your businesses if you don't do those sorts of activities. However, in California, the right is much more expansive. The CPRA will give consumers the ability to opt out of profiling regardless of whether it has a significant effect on the consumer. So depending on further guidance from California regulators, this could even allow consumers to opt out of common digital marketing techniques such as inferring a person's interests or purchasing propensities. So for many of you, this could have a notable impact on many of your businesses and how you internally conduct your digital targeting and advertising and segmenting um, if this opt-out right does have end up having such a broad applicability. Much the same way that the that the new opt-out rights for sharing sensitive personal information might impact the ability to create consum consumer rights. Um, sorry, much the same way that these targeted advertising opt-out rights will impact uh, potentially your, your digital marketing campaigns. There's the, Yane will talk in a moment about sensitive personal information opt-outs and how those could have a, a very broad impact on uh, your common digital marketing activities as well. So in terms of sensitive personal information, uh, we have new definitions, we have new categories of sensitive personal information for the first time in the US. 
Um, all, all, all of the laws uh, touch on this. Uh, California has the most expansive definition. It, it follows the GDPR uh, definition of special categories of data to a large degree. Virginia and Colorado have much narrower definitions. But the difference and the interesting piece here about this definition of sensitive personal information is what action it triggers. In Virginia and Colorado, in order to collect it, you need an affirmative opt-in. That's brand new in the US. Again, the US has historically always opted, uh, always operated on an opt-out model. So to do a 180 and, and require an opt-in is, is, is fundamentally different. California still requires an opt-out for the sharing of certain personal information. If you think about what this means operationally for businesses, we've talked about the need to include links to opt out of data sales. Now we're including links on websites to opt out of the sharing of certain sensitive information. There are links to opt out of the sharing of certain information for tag targeted advertising. There are new consent mechanics that are gonna have to be required on websites and in apps in order to collect sensitive personal information. Operationally, this is just coming out of three states. And so let's suppose we have about three links required. Multiply that by 50 states and let's, let's envisage what, what the problems could really be. So this is, this is a precursor to what we could be looking at across multiple other states. Another new area um, in, in, these, in these laws, which is again, somewhat revolutionary in the US, is the prescriptive requirement to impose downstream obligations on vendors and service providers. So we know that vendors who have access to personal information of consumers uh, create vulnerabilities for companies in their processing of that data. The new state privacy laws have extended the consumer protection obligations to these third parties. Some states like Virginia have modeled these third party requirements in a manner similar to GDPR by designating an entity as a controller or a processor. Other states are following the standards set by the CCPA and using the terms business or service provider. Regardless of the terminology, it's clear that these states intend to impose privacy obligations to downstream recipients of consumer personal information. To give you a flavor of what is required in these new contracts, the CPRA requires that prior to sharing any consumer personal information, a business must enter into a written contract with a service provider that specifies the limited um, purpose for which information should be used. It must mandate the same level of protections as those imposed on the business. It grants audit rights um, to the business. It requires service providers to notify the business if they can no longer comply with CPRA, and it grants the business the authority to take steps to remediate unauthorized use of data by that service provider. And remember, to avoid triggering a sale of data, a business is required to enter into a contract that specifies that the entity receiving that data is a service provider. And that means including very specific language in the contract that delineates and characterizes the role of the entity as a service provider and limits its use of, of that data. So there are a lot of contractual obligations now imposed on, on vendors and there are significant implications for missing key contractual provisions in terms of the implications of data sales. To comply in California with the new provisions related to data retention schedules, businesses will need to begin to develop a data retention schedule that internally at least governs how long different types of personal information are kept, along with any exceptions to those deletion schedules, such as where their retention may be required by law enforcement or as part of a standard litigation hold, for instance. But regardless of legal requirements, we always counsel clients that it's best practice to have a, a retention schedule when it comes to personal information and not just the, the business confidential work uh, because it's good data hygiene. 
and because it mitigates the risk of a potential data breach in the future. The less data that you have in your CRM, the less data that could be lost in a data breach. So that's uh, sort of the age old put, you know, tug and pull between the marketing side of, of your, your enterprise and the legal side. But we always recommend having a, a robust um, data retention schedule for personal data um, in particular because uh, it just helps with data minim minimization requirements and, and overall good data hygiene. Um, on this point, businesses will also need to supplement their privacy notices with information about how long each type of personal information will be kept. And this seems like a, a good time to remind everyone that under US law, it's a now a statutory requirement to update privacy policies and review them on at least an annual basis. So it's no longer just best practice to do so, it is now a prescriptive requirement to do so under California law at least. The new obligations under US state laws to conduct PRAs or DPIAs are similar to those under the GDPR. However, what's noteworthy is the types of activities that trigger the need to conduct a PRA in the United States, some of which are very commonplace activities that most of your organizations probably do routinely, such as using personal information for targeted advertising, selling personal information, using it for automated decision-making purposes, or processing sensitive personal information. Um, so if you're engaging in any one of those four types of activities, especially um, targeted advertising, um, you likely are now under US law going to have to conduct PRAs or DPIAs in advance of those sorts of activities. Uh, further, to comply in California, you will also need to conduct an annual cybersecurity audit if you engage in any type of processing that presents, quote, significant risks to consumers' privacy based on the volume and sensitivity of the data, as well as the size and complexity of your own organization. Uh, the California statute specifically requires that these audits be independent and thorough. So we'll see from the CPRA rulemaking if independent truly means you have to bring in a third party auditor to do it, but there is now under California law a statutory obligation to conduct cybersecurity audits in addition to a general DPIA or PRA process. Um, and you, you will be obligated to provide copies of your PRAs to regulators, so they need to be thoughtful and fulsome. They can't just be a check the box exercise. You're going to have to put some real care into these because you're not going to be the only person looking at these, uh, especially in California. And we saved a special treat for the end of our remarks to make sure that you're all still listening. Uh, the U.S. has also introduced a brand new concept of financial incentives. This is sort of a new concept here. A financial incentive is what you think it would be. It's when a business charges a lower price or offers a better quality of product or service in exchange for the consumer allowing the business to collect, sell, use, or retain uh, their personal information. So a very common example that you've probably encountered in your, your personal lives is if you go to a, a website you know, to, to shop for something online and you see a little pop-up that says, um, you know, sign up for our email list and get 10% off your first purchase. That's a very common type of financial incentive, at least in the U.S. Um, and it's important, these things are not prohibited under California law. They're totally allowed but there are important guardrails that you need to implement to ensure compliance with U.S. state laws. Uh, first and foremost, the incentive needs to be reasonably related to the value of the information, which is going to impose an obligation on businesses to actually undertake some efforts to quantify the value of a consumer's information. So putting those actual analysis into place what do a thousand email addresses mean to us? Or what do a thousand email addresses of first time buyers mean to us? Or what do a thousand email addresses of repeat buyers mean to us? To put some level of analysis into that value of data. Uh, you also under US law will need to provide a disclosure of the key terms, such as the fact that participation is voluntary, the existence of a right to withdraw consent to the fi uh, financial incentive, uh, and the ability to actually, you give them the ability to withdraw that consent. The gold standard that you know we, we always mention, don't require clients to do, but the gold standard uh, in the US would be to have that disclosure in full text at the actual point of collection or enrollment in the incentive. 
It's very uncommon to see that practically in the US. What we see more commonly is to, at the very least, include a hyperlink at that point of collection or enrollment that if someone clicks it, they'll be taken directly to the portion of the privacy notice or a standalone page that lays out those key terms. Uh, and obviously you need to get prior opt-in consent and you always need to let a consumer opt out if they wanna leave the financial incentive. So this means that when I went to that consumer website and I signed up, I used my 10% discount code and made my Christmas purchases. As soon as I've gotten that, I'm allowed to opt out and unsubscribe from the email list and the business has no recourse. So uh, you know, businesses may find themselves sort of on the short end of that transaction, but it is the price of doing business now under uh, the emerging US privacy framework. We should make clear, Chris, that we received no financial incentives whatsoever for making this webinar, which suggests to me that our personal information had limited, if any, value at all, um, just to be clear on that point. Um, so this brings us to the conclusion of our sample compliance program. And to, to summarize the approach to compliance, we proposed a singular streamlined approach based on the highest common denominator among the laws and only making state specific adjustments if a material difference would significantly lessen a company's compliance burden. To execute this approach, you need to first scope out the areas of data subject to these privacy laws and then prepare a legal matrix identifying the overlaps and the variances to determine to what extent the obligations will apply or vary to your organization under all of the applicable laws. For example, an opt-out may be required in California, but not in Virginia for the same kind of processing activity. The first step obviously involves a data mapping exercise to identify what data your business collects, what data you process, where you store it, who you share it with, which third parties receive it, including vendors, and then characterize those vendors as service providers to avoid data sales if that's your objective. And then you need to identify profiling activities and high risk activities. So that governance step of data mapping is critical to addressing a variety of elements of these new laws. Then you can embark on the additional work streams we've described, including revising record retention programs to address the new data minimization requirements, revising your vendor contracts to address the new downstream obligations on, on vendors, assessing the opt-outs and consent requirements under these new laws, which may be a very granular analysis, implementing appropriate security measures to avoid those class action suits that we talked about, addressing privacy notices and information security policies, addressing the consumer rights that have been established under these new laws, and assessing the extent to which the company can avail itself of any of the legal exemptions that apply in connection with these uh, privacy obligations. The approach we've proposed is intended to be flexible and scalable to try to adapt to and absorb the additional new laws that we expect to be passed. As Chris has mentioned earlier, it's not about if we'll see new laws in the US, it's about when. And we hope that uh, this flexible approach will be um, able to accommodate and adjust and be nimble enough to address those new laws as they come down the pipe. So thank you very much for listening. And uh, we, uh, we look forward to receiving questions. And if we are uh, short on time now, we will absolutely be able to respond to you um, via email. Right. Well, thanks very much. That is tremendous. We've covered an enormous amount of ground and you were very disciplined in covering the material you prepared. But we, due to my introduction, you lost five minutes or we've, let's give you an extra five minutes. Questions have been pouring in and um, I've said that you've kindly uh, agreed to reply to them in writing. But I will give you a hint of what the questions are. Uh, some of them are too I think lengthy, you won't have time to answer them, but some of them you may be able to say yes, no, or, or, or give a very quick answer. So let's go. I've got eight in front of me now that I've noted. They're not everyone's questions, but some of them. The first one is, are there efforts to unify the legal regulations between the states, between the state's attorney generals, I think, attorneys general? 
I, I, I think in, in, that there's certainly collaboration and discussion amongst um, state AGs and, and regulators at the state level. And in fact, you've seen um, a significant amount of overlap between the states in terms of the, the, the substance of the laws that have been proposed. And if we're looking for common themes, you know, I, I've been in the US now for more than a decade and, and I started practicing privacy in Europe um, at the time the original directive, uh, the predecessor to GDPR was implemented. And when I read these new privacy bills that are proposed in the US, often they do mirror word for word in many cases, what we've seen in Europe for more than two decades. Um, so I think that you are seeing some level of uniformity in the principles underpinning the laws, but each state does take a different approach to um, some of the nuances, um, some of the consent mechanics, and certainly the, the enforcement regime differs and the rigor with which they enforce this regime differs from state to state. Yeah, so they do have a conference, as I recall, the attorneys general have a conference where they discuss such matters. Um, yeah. Okay, next one. <clears throat> Is there any desire to move away from opt-out rights, which may or may not be exercised, to opt-out by default? So is there a sort of strong stream of opt-out by default? I would note, at least in, in two of the, the state laws that are under proposal, that are still alive in the current legislative session, two of those, as I mentioned, would require an opt-in for the data sales. That's New York and Massachusetts. Um, those are still probably the outliers. There is generally a, a strong resistance among the business community in the U.S. to, to move into an opt-in regime, but there are certainly efforts to, to undertake that. I, I would doubt that it would become the, the rule uh, nationwide, but certainly you could see some outlier states move to more of an opt-in regime rather than an opt-out regime, certainly. Right. Okay. Well, we're moving swiftly on to any in state laws, do any of the rights apply to people who are outside that state or even outside the US? So it's, it's a bit distinct from the GDPR in that regard. The state laws in the US um, are applicable to the residents uh, and they don't, uh, you know, so residents of the state and those are the, the recipients of the, of the main protection. So um, it could follow you uh, around, um, but it wouldn't follow a non-state resident who happens to come into that state. Right. Okay. Yeah, uh, Stuart, one, one point on that, that, that it's important to note, particularly for uh, the audience that are overseas or outside the U.S., you know, there, there is this misconception that, for example, um, California law really, if, if you don't have operations or exposure to California, you don't need to comply with it. The reality is California is the fifth largest economy in the world. So if you have operations in the US, you are going to get exposure to California. And to the extent that California has been the um, cheerleader in terms of regulation across the US, many of the states that have started to implement these new laws have emulated the approach taken in California. So it, it, it's important to recognize that whilst states govern the personal information of their residents, the downstream effects of the implementation of their laws can have much broader implications across the nation. Right. Okay. Moving on to another one. Are businesses required to have a GDPR type agreement with their vendors? Obviously, yes, with their consumers, but what about their vendors? So if they're subcontracting processing? Yeah, so we, 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 we tried to talk about that on, on one of the slides. Um, so under GDPR, you've got the Article 28 requirements on processors. Um, in, in the US now, there, there is a movement to uh, implement a, an equivalent form of DPA. But it's important to, to realize that the specific contractual obligations differ from what you see in Article 28. And there is some very important nuances in how you draft those contracts because they the drafting of those obligations on the vendors will have implications as to whether or not your sharing of data with those vendors constitute a sale of data or not. And if it constitutes a sale, you have to include that opt-out link on your website. So there is most definitely an obligation to include those types of contractual obligations on vendors, but the, the, the magic is in the drafting of those provisions. 
which, which a, a good legal advisor is necessary. Right. Um, we'll have just two more. Um, I think this uh, one is just your your uh, judgment from dealing with clients are um, regarding data retention policies. Are companies do you consider that date that companies are actively implementing their data retention policies? They have them, but are they taking trouble to actually implement them and, and take notice and conform with them? We, yeah, we, we we've seen we, we've seen uh, companies start to mobilize on that front you know historically that had been something on the on on, on the back burner um, for many companies but now there are specific requirements in these state laws that that mandate efforts on that front also data retention feeds into a variety of other privacy domains you know in in, in terms of the proportionality of what you're keeping and the exposure you have by keeping too much that might be unnecessary in the event that there's a security breach. So the, the ramifications of uh, data retention go beyond data retention and they, they, they delve into other areas that create significant exposure for companies in the US. Right. And if I may store one quick point on that is we, we often counsel clients that these policies that we help them draft are not meant to collect dust on a shelf. Data retention policies certainly but closely related, as Ian mentioned, are the incident response plans. And that these policies do you no good as an organization if you aren't actively looking at them and using them. So one thing we frequently counsel our clients is to take out your incident response plan, test it, do a tabletop exercise. We'll help you do that. Those sorts of things, make sure that it's not just collecting dust and worthless, but actually serving a purpose to, to protect your organization. Sure. And also kind of military training, have instant response uh, game plan type of thing. Uh, always it works well. OK, and the last one here, I mean, there were many questions, but it's the last one I'm going to put to you now because we're sort of running out of time. Um, where there is a requirement to have an annual audit um, applying to a company, do companies tend to apply them to their service providers as well as to their, themselves? Under the, the current formulation, there's not an explicit requirement that you uh, do a security audit annually of your of your subcontractors or your processors. However, there is a general requirement to vet those types of vendors. So, you know, whether that's an annual cybersecurity audit, whether that's an annual questionnaire, uh, it's a bit open. However, there is an affirmative obligation on businesses under U.S. law. To, to exercise that upfront diligence as well as an ongoing annual type of diligence to ensure uh, continued compliance with those sorts of data security requirements. Right. Okay. Well, I appreciate very much that you put you on the spot by sharing the questions with you. We, we will put them to you in writing so you'll have more time to reflect and I'll answer in more detail. But it's very helpful of the audience. I'm sure very pleased that you've taken the trouble to, to answer those briefly and, and to the point. So thank you. So thank you to our speakers today, Ye and Jolly and Chris Ekdahl. Um, Yes, and Link Later, thank you for sponsoring this event and of course the audience all around the world for joining us. The video, as some of you have asked, the video of this session will be available soon after the session has ended and uh, you will get the, the slides will be available from tomorrow. We welcome everyone's feedback and ideas for future online and indeed live events. And we look forward to keeping in contact with you via our news, uh, UK and international reports, events uh, and our podcasts. Our next webinar, is sponsored by one trust and will take place on tuesday 7th of december and the title is privacy trust and personalization in a cookie world and a note for your calendar our first hybrid live and online event will be uh, on the 14th of february in london hosted by norton rose which has a wonderful conference room overlooking the iconic tower bridge spanning the river thames so it's uh, a joy to be there we were last there exactly 10 years before. The subject is reform of the UK's GDPR and the UK's international adequacy programme. So you can celebrate St Valentine's Day with us at Privacy Laws of Business. It will make your day and ensure greatly enhance your relationships with your, your, closest, your closest people. Um, so we'd love to see you there. And indeed, note in your calendars the dates for our 35th Privacy Laws and Business World Breaking 35th Anniversary International Conference, 4th to 6th of July next year at St John's College, Cambridge. And we look forward to meeting you there in person. Let's know if you want to propose a session, uh, be a speaker or become a sponsor.
So that is all for now. Thank you again to our speakers and to you, our audience, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>